Welcome to our first ever episode of Unnamed Women of the Book of Mormon. It's a special bonus series from the Sunday on Monday podcast brought to you by LDS Living and Deseret Bookshelf Plus. Now, what is Sunday on Monday? It is a weekly podcast where we take the Come Follow Me lesson for the week and we really dig into the scriptures together. If you want to know more about that podcast, click on the link in our description or you can go to ldsliving.com slash Sunday on Monday and you can actually click on podcasts anywhere up there and sign up for a free 30-day trial of Deseret Bookshelf Plus where you can find every single episode of goodness from this podcast. Now, my favorite thing about Sunday on Monday and this podcast is that I get to invite friends to join me to discuss scriptures, and in this case, women in scriptures. So it is always a little bit different each week. And today, my guests joining me for this first discussion of the unnamed women of the Book of Mormon are Amelia Webb and Ella Larson. Hello, ladies. Hello. Hey. Oh my gosh, we're so excited. I'm so excited. You too. Okay. For those of you who don't know them, they have a podcast and I want you to tell us all about your podcast because I want people to listen to it. It's really quite remarkable. So tell us how you know each other and then tell us about your podcast. Sweet. Um, yeah. So Amelia and I met when we were in seventh or eighth grade um, and we became super good friends all through high school. And um after we could both got home from our missions um, about like a year and a half ago, we just kind of realized that we missed talking about the Savior so much. And I've always loved listening to podcasts. And like, it was always a secret dream of mine to like start a podcast. I had no <laughs> idea what it was going to be about. Um, but we just decided to go for it. So <laughs> our podcast is called Relevant. And our goal is to make Christ more relevant to our listeners. Um, And we do that by discussing a name of Christ or just like a topic about him every week. So we study it and then we talk about it for like 15 to 20 minutes. And yeah, our episodes are kind of directed towards young adults and teenagers because we realize there aren't very many gospel podcasts for teens like a lot of them Mm -hmm. feel like they're more for adults so anyway it's been super fun well this is how do you guys come up with the topic or the title tell me about that process it kind of it it totally depends that's such a good question sometimes we just kind of alternate and i'll do one this week and then ella will do one the next week or sometimes our listeners will send something in or sometimes like i'll just get pulled over and be like, oh, this would make a really good metaphor for this name of Christ. <laughs> like it really... <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Sense. What do you mean pulled over? <laughs> Tell me about that. <laughs> well, the other day I got, I was um, just on a street down here in Provo and um, I ended up getting pulled over for the first time in my life. Okay. I'd like to say this is not a normal <laughs> occurrence. Okay. So I got, I got pulled over and um, I realized that the reason I got pulled over was because um, it was really early in the morning. And so there was absolutely no one on the roads, which I am not used to. So I think I got a little excited okay. speed wise. And I, it hit me. I was like, man, this whole time I've been complaining about how there are always people on this road and it's so annoying. But those same people are the, are the ones who kept me from getting pulled over because I had to go crazy slow, you know? Um, and so then it just made me think about how a lot of times we complain about, um, we just want to do things ourselves, right? We just want to go on our own. But a lot of times having other people around us that God sends into our lives or Christ himself, that's, that's the one thing that keeps us safe at the end of the day. So (laughs) I got pulled over and as the officer was talking to me, I was like, you don't even know, but this is going to be some good content (laughs) for my Christian podcast. (laughs) So (laughs) the fact that you can take that situation and turn it around to, to show Christ, I'm in. I think that is so fantastic. So can people find your podcast just on, where can they find it? Apple podcasts? What, what is your platform? Yeah, we're on Apple and Spotify right now. So, okay. So go check it out. Uh It's called Relevant. Oh my gosh. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Well, we're going to have such a fun discussion and I'm going to let these women talk a little bit more about who we're talking about today. So let me just introduce it by telling you this. Okay. And you two are going to find this fascinating. So there is a woman who is in the church seminary and institute 
history of the church. Her name is Margot J. Butler. I think today she's in her late 80s. She is the woman who is credited for having written and implemented the very first Women in Scripture study course back in 1982. And I got to work with her when I taught seminary and institute right before she retired. And she was a wealth of information. And when she was retiring, I went into her office to talk to her about the decision to get my master's degree because I wasn't really certain if I wanted one because I was going to get married and have kids. And yeah. she set me straight so fast. <laughs> She's just like, what a waste. If you have time to get a master's, you get a master's because your kids are going to need you to be educated. Anyway, she wagged her finger at me and in her beautiful Australian accent, convinced me to get my master's degree. And then she's cleaning off her shelves and getting rid of books because she's retiring. And she gave me stacks and stacks of books and all of her papers she's ever written. So I was going through them, looking at all of her women in scripture papers. And I found an article so old. It's from a, um, a seminary and institute conference back in the 80s. And she was speaking to a room full of men on the topic of women in scriptures. And here's what she said at this talk or this conference. She said, quote, the first time I taught Book of Mormon, one of the young women in my class asked, where are the girls? All there is, is boys, boys, boys. And then she goes on to say, I had not thought of it like that. So I went scuttling back to the scriptures. And sure enough, there were boys, boys, boys. Now, this began her interest in women in scripture. So she goes on to say about the Book of Mormon and the history of women throughout time, she says, the wonder is not that there is so little about women in the Book of Mormon, but that there is so much given the times and traditions. So I like how she took that. She could have been so angry and upset, but she realized given the times and traditions of Nephi and by and all biblical scholars, and then Joseph Smith, it would have been perfectly appropriate for them to not write about a single woman. So she then took the big, the big task of finding women in scripture, named and unnamed, which is kind of where this whole um, idea for the podcast comes from. So here are a few that we're going to be discussing this year. For those of you who are wondering, like what unnamed women of the Book of Mormon will be covering? Here they are. Women in the wilderness. Then we're going to talk about Lamoni's wife, the queen and Lamoni's mother, Queen Abish, then Morianton's servant, and then, of course, the mothers of the stripling warriors. And then today's topic, we are going to talk about Lehi's wife and Lehi's daughters. So here we go. Let's just jump right into Lehi's wife and daughters. And you two, I loved your enthusiasm so much when we were texting and talking back and forth. Why were you excited to talk about Sariah and, Le and Lehi's daughters? Yeah, I first I just loved... Because when you sent us these women, I was kind of like, okay, yeah, what is there about them in the Book of Mormon, right? And so I loved the opportunity of just like kind of scanning through the Book of Mormon, looking for these women and really focusing on their stories. Um, and it helped me realize how much the Book of Mormon means to me. Like it is so special and yeah, I just think these women are amazing. All right, then let's do this, ladies. Let's first talk about Sariah, the wife of Lehi, the mother of Nephi, Laman, Lemuel, Sam, Jacob, Joseph, and sisters, which we're going to get to later. But first, tell me <laughs> everything you learned about Sariah. Oh my gosh. Okay, so for her, I actually, on Relevant, sometimes we tell little personal stories to kind of make these scripture stories more relevant. Mm -hmm. um, so if you don't mind, this, her story reminded me just of myself in some ways. I just was so moved by how willing she is to, to talk. She seems like she likes to talk, you know. When I was little, um, for whatever reason, I would kind of use, I think one gift that I've been given is just utilizing words to convince, you know, and I think I even recognized that as a little kid, right? So I remember on the playground, if there were kids who were swearing, I was the one who would tell them, how horrible is that? Or like, if <laughs> there, there was like, I remember the first time I realized that maybe this wasn't a completely um, helpful gift is in kindergarten. I have this I have this very real memory in kindergarten of this kid named William. I don't know if he took my toy or something, but I, the honorable five-year-old that I was, I thought, I'm going to fix this, you know? Mm -hmm. So I went up to my teacher and I said, you know, Miss Stone, like, 
here's the thing about William, you know, and I just, I just <laughs> let her know, you know, I just updated yeah. her a little bit. So she would be aware. And she said, Amelia, have you ever heard of the word tattletale? <laughs> and, I, and, and I just like burst into tears because here I thought I was doing like this honorable deed, you know, mm -hmm. but yeah, just like as a kid, I have these memories of me just using my words to kind of get people in trouble sometimes. But it's so interesting as I've kind of grown up at some point, there was a change and I can't really pinpoint it. But instead of using these words to get people in trouble, I really want to use them to get people out of trouble. And instead of mm -hmm. turning them in, I feel really passionate now about turning them to Jesus. I think that's a lot of what relevant has become. And over the years, God wasn't like, oh, you know, you blew your shot with the whole talking thing. Maybe let's try listening. Let's let's swap out your <laughs> gift of talking and let's do let's try listening instead, Amelia, and see what we can do with that. And I just am thinking a lot about Soraya and the few verses that we have. She has this quality of strength and she's not afraid to speak her mind and not afraid to make things happen using her words to convince others. Can you um, give us some examples? Yes, of course. Give us some examples of the words that she spoke. I think that'd be really powerful to hear. For sure. Yeah. In verse two, she says, she complained against my father, Lehi, telling him that he was a visionary man saying, behold, thou hast led us forth from the land of our inheritance and my sons are no more and we perish in the wilderness. But then just a few verses later, she has this, she's using her words to glorify God. And in verse eight, she says, now I know of a surety that the Lord hath commanded my husband to flee into the wilderness. So just this, a whole 100% turnaround. And the only thing in the middle is an experience with Christ. It reminds me of that quote from The Chosen that's kind of become big. I was one way, now I'm the other, and the only thing in between was him. And I just feel like this is so powerful because it's so reassuring that she teaches us that we don't need to change our personality to be people of faith. We just need to spend a little bit more time with Christ so he can use that same personality in a way that will enhance our life and the lives of others. Mm, beautiful. I love well, that. Ella, I have a follow-up question for you because I want to know, okay, here we are, and Nephi is writing this account, and some believe he wrote it 30 years after, like he's a grown adult man, and then he goes back to write his journal pages. Of all the things he could have written about his mother, which was, he could have written anything, this yeah. is what he chose to write about her, about her complaining and being upset at her husband, and then like you said, having a turnaround experience and coming under Christ. Why do you think he chose this moment to write about for us to study? Yeah, well, um, I think that there's a lot of reasons, but I was thinking about how interesting it was that Soraya didn't need her kitchen tools to be brought back to say, okay, I know this is from God. I'm going to keep going in the wilderness. She didn't need her, I don't know, I'm, I'm trying to think of like other things that probably made her life super helpful that they didn't have because mm -hmm. they were in the wilderness, right? All she needed was her sons. Like once they came back in verse eight, she has that complete turnaround moment, like Amelia said. And I think that this is a woman who had her priorities straight. Like she knew that all she needed was her family and God. And once she has that, she's like, okay, I'll do whatever you need. I know that, like, she bears her testimony in verse 8. Yeah, read the whole um, verse for us. Yeah, she says, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath commanded my husband to flee into the wilderness. And I also know of a surety that the Lord hath protected my sons and delivered them out of the hands of Laban and given them power whereby they could accomplish the thing which the Lord hath commanded them. And so I think that's such an example of humility mm -hmm. that she was able to fully see God's hand instead of giving some excuse like, oh, well, I still don't really know if God led us here, Lehi, but I guess my sons are back. You know, she doesn't, she doesn't give any sort of excuse. She completely embraces Lehi's testimony and kind of goes back on her own 
um, complaints, right? She says, okay, I was wrong. I see now that God is in control. And I just think that that's so moving and so powerful. Like that's hard to do, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, this is kind of fun. I'm going to give you two things that support everything you just said. So the first okay. thing is what does her name mean in Hebrew? Because this is so awesome. Now, do you guys know what your names mean? Have you ever looked in a baby names book and look it up? I'm pretty sure when I looked mine, I think I've looked multiple times and my name means beautiful fairy woman or something like that. And I'm like, I don't know well, if that's hello. real. <laughs> <laughs> well, hello, beautiful fairy woman. That <laughs> yeah. makes me so happy. <laughs> I love that you're putting your hair behind your ears. Yes, I am. Beautiful fairy woman. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. What about you, um, Amelia? I can't 100% remember. I just remember that I love that the verb ameliorate means to make something better. I just uh, always okay. love that. Yeah. Okay. That is so, so awesome to make things better. Okay. This is, uh, this is one of my favorite childhood stories because when I was in elementary school in fifth grade is when the book came out, which was Baby Names. It was a big deal back in the 80s. That's how old I am. Mm -hmm. And we all sat around on the playground with my very best friends and everybody looked up their name. And it was super duper exciting because Charlotte looked up her name and it said Petite One. And Tiffany looked up her name and it said Gift of God. Um, Sarah or Soraya, which is so cool, she looked up her name and it means Princess of Jehovah, which... Hello. Hi. Sarai, of course she was the princess of Jehovah. That's what her name means. Um, I looked at my name. So then I'm like, give me the book. I can't wait. I can't wait. And I thumb through and I'm like, T, 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 T. And I get down to Tamara and I looked it up and everyone's looking at me with anticipation. <laughs> I might have cried because I said, palm tree. <laughs> That's what my name means. Everybody had a, a name that related to God and mine was palm tree. I was devastated. I've told that story before because I've since come to learn the significance of palm tree in scriptures. And now I love it. Like it's the perfect name for me. But princess of Jehovah, I mean, that is incredible because we have this name. It's derived from the Hebrew root Sar, S-A-R, which means prince or princess. And then Yah, which means Jehovah. So Sarai Yah is her name. And she is indeed a princess of Jehovah. But let me take it one step further. So here's something we do know about Sariah that Nephi introduces at the very beginning. So turn to 1 Nephi chapter 1, verse 1. And I would love to know your thoughts on this. Okay, 1 Nephi chapter 1, verse 1. In fact, you guys don't even need to turn there. I bet you could absolutely recite it. I, Nephi, finish it for me. Having, having been born, been born of, of goodly parents. parents. Perfect. There it is. I, Nephi, having been born of goodly parents. Okay, that word goodly, you guys, this is so cool. So throughout the many years of scholarship, and you can read a lot on what this word goodly means. And I remember as a seminary teacher, I taught that it could be a couple different ways. It could mean literally that they're good, taken from the word tov, in Hebrew, and the word good is used after every creation, and God saw that it was good, meaning complete, full, good. Then Hunibli came in later, and he said that it's a possibility that it could be referring to all of the goodness that his parents left, the jewels, the riches, the honor. And so I need by having been born of wealthy parents. So that's another way. But then this one, is my favorite. It's new scholarship and it blew my mind because there is LDS scholarship that supports the idea that the word goodly or goodness in scriptures is a synonym for covenant blessing and covenant keeping. Now listen to this verse. Hmm. I, Nephi, having been born of covenant keeping parents. How does that affect the way we view Sariah? Oh my, I think that's, that's so cool. I wish that were just common knowledge. Like I wish, I wish I just already knew that, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think I love that this is the first verse of the entire Book of Mormon, you know? Like this book that is such a testament of the Savior, how does it start name dropping Sarai and talking about that she's one of Christ's people? And I, yeah. I think that's amazing that it's the first verse. Oh, I like the way you said that. What about you, Ella? Yeah, I just think it's cool that it's, this is the introduction, you know? I think Nephi goes on to become this amazing prophet, and right here, he establishes that one of the reasons 
is because of his parents, because of the influence that his mom and dad had on him because they were covenant keepers and because they chose to do really hard things, Mm -hmm. you know? So. And for me, when I'm looking at this, I also think, wow, okay, covenant keeping parents and they still had their struggles. Yeah. There was nothing came easy. You know, I think maybe that's a cool part of it, starting out like covenant keeping parents and it was hard. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You know, I I think that message is important for all of us that because (laughs) because you keep your covenants, it does not mean it's going to be free sailing throughout your life. Yeah, no. When did covenant keeping become significant to you in your life? Your return missionaries, you're in college. Tell me about that. One thought that came to my mind when you said that was, I remember... In the first couple of months of being a missionary, I was training this new missionary who had just come in. And it, this was during COVID. And because of COVID, none of us had been able to go to the temple beforehand to get endowed. So we all sometime in our mission were shipped out to a temple and some of our parents flew in. And then we had that endowment experience as missionaries, which was pretty cool. But I remember I got endowed on my mission And a couple months later, I got this brand new missionary who had just gotten in doubt herself before she came out um, because things had finally calmed down a little bit with COVID and she could go before she came into the mission. And I remember we were sitting down and we were studying one time and she just looked me dead in the eye and she said, Sister Webb, like, I feel like ever since I've gotten in doubt, I just feel the spirit. Like I just have these thoughts that come to my mind and I just like the gospel is so much more rich. Like it was almost like her level of spiritual intellect had been somehow elevated. Mm -hmm. And throughout that time that we spent together as missionaries, she just like every day she'd give these thoughts that were on some like a higher caliber. And it was like, it was like her endowment had literally endowed her with this gift of understanding the gospel. And it was so real to her because it was just so black and white of how things were before. Kind of like we said, I was one way and now I'm the other. And the only thing in between was Jesus and what are covenants, but Jesus, you know? So I think that was a wake up call for me that, oh my gosh, an endowment is not just kind of this cloud that's ambiguous. No, it's this real thing that, makes us think about things the way that Jesus thinks about things. It's crazy. Oh, I love, love, love that you just said this, that her endowment was this gift that helped her to view everything through with Christ because, oh my gosh, Amelia, you couldn't have summed up what the endowment is more perfectly than a gift. That is awesome. It is. It is absolutely a gift. And so I really love that you just connected those two words together. That was perfect. Just jump in, Ella. No. Yeah, I I feel like my covenants have always been important to me. Like mm. ever since I was baptized, I um when I was 12 years old, my mom invited me to like read two pages of the Book of Mormon every day. And I definitely mm. wasn't perfect, but I just I have these memories of like sitting on my floor reading the Book of Mormon and just feeling like excited about it, just feeling the spirit testify that these things are true and they're real and they can impact you. And I think I've definitely gone through ebbs and flows in my covenant keeping or in my testimony, but I I value so much that influence of the spirit in my life. And I can really tell when I am striving for those covenants, just the happiness that it brings me and the peace that's in my life, Um, the peace that I feel in the temple. Like, I I just can't find that anywhere else. And so, yeah, I'm so grateful for my covenants and for the opportunity that I have to receive that gift and to have more of Christ in my life because of those commitments. Ella, tell me a little bit more about the comment when you said, I've definitely have ebbs and flows in my life. Because yeah. that was really powerful. 
when you connect it to keeping covenants because you want to think that there are no ebbs and flows. But then you have Soraya here. Talk about an ebb and flow. Like here she is complaining yeah. against her husband. Like, I can't believe you made us do this and our kids might die. But you said <laughs> that worry is an equation of love. And that was yeah. a boy. Talk about a roller coaster in chapter five of ebb and flow of emotions and trusting God and all of that. So can you tell us a little bit about your ebb and flow as a covenant keeper? Yeah, I think like um, especially coming home from a mission, it's been a little bit hard because as a missionary, you just have this constant spirit and constant drive to be an errand girl for Christ, right? Like that's mm-hmm. what you're doing all the time. And so coming home has been hard for me because it's like not, I don't have that same calling anymore. And so I feel those ebbs and flows. I feel times where I'm super on top of my scripture study and I I feel like God is teaching me in that way. And then sometimes I'm not as good at it, right? And mm-hmm. I think it's beautiful that with the sacrament prayer, it says that we just have to be willing to take mm-hmm. upon him, upon us, his name, right? And so covenants are set up in a way that we don't have to be perfect, God knows that we're going to be ebbing and flowing. And that's the whole point, right? It's mm-hmm. it's to come here and it's to yoke ourselves with Christ so that when we're down, he can lift us and he can, his grace can come in and help us. And we can always have hope of better tomorrow, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So this is a quick question. I didn't even prep you for this, but I want to know. Give me what is one thing you do on a daily basis that helps you to stay goodly, that helps you to stay a covenant keeper. Just one thing Um, you do. That's really good. I think, I mean, the biggest thing that comes to my mind is just praying, Mm -hmm. like asking God every morning for him to be in my day, for me to see his hand Mm -hmm. and for his power to carry me through um and i think that's like maybe maybe a small thing but also if you have that mindset you're going to see god more and you're going to remember your covenants so perfect answer i like that amelia I was going to second prayer, but I'll do a, I'll do a different one. But just everyone know that prayer is on the mind today for sure <laughs> um i i think just these, the random acts of kindness. Um, like sometimes you give someone a, a cookie and you're like, why do I feel amazing? Like I just gave someone a little <laughs> cookie. Like, why does this feel so good? You know? And I think <laughs> just doing little things like that just reminds me that just as I'm like overwhelmed with this feeling of joy from a tiny little thing that I'm doing, like God is overwhelmed by being involved in my life. You know, it's not it's not a burden to him. It's something that he gets this very real, you know, mm-hmm. this joy. And so I think that's that's motivated me more to be a better covenant keeper because I'm like, hey, this is a happy thing. You know, I'm happy about it. God's happy about it. This is living after the manner of happiness oh, as, as like a covenant that. keeping life. Yeah. Ooh, what a great way to say that too. It is living after the manner of happiness. Awesome. Okay, well then let's do this. Let's turn in our scriptures to an example of covenant keepers. And they are the unnamed covenant keepers, the unnamed women that we wanted to include in this discussion. We're going to go to 2 Nephi chapter 5, verse 6. In 2 Nephi chapter 5, this is where we get the great division of the brothers and the families. And we're going to decide who follows Nephi and who doesn't. And Nephi writes, who followed him? Second Nephi chapter five, verse six. And Ella, will you read that for us? Yes. Wherefore, it came to pass that I, Nephi, did take my family and also Zoram and his family and Sam, my elder brother and his family, and Jacob and Joseph, my younger brethren, and also my sisters and all those who would go with me and all those who would go with me were those who believed in the warnings and the revelations of God. Wherefore, they did hearken unto my words. Thank you. All right, there they are, my sisters. This is kind of cool. Did you guys know it is the only time the word sisters is used in the Book of Mormon? 
right here. Wow. Really? Yes. I thought that was so surprising. And so he's introducing his sisters. And I asked you guys to think about this question because I wanted to know, how does knowing that Nephi had sisters affect the way you read First Nephi now? Tell me about that. I had never even... I. That question is it just leads to so many good thoughts. And I think everyone should ask themselves that question. Maybe even pause the podcast and, and think about it mm-hmm. for a second. Because I think just, man, thinking about it led to a lot of cool um, thoughts for me. But one that I had was, you know how there's there's a verse that talks about when they get the compass, when they get the liahona. And then a, a couple of verses later, it talks about how it works and they figure out that it, it works according to their faith and their diligence. And something that hit me was, it doesn't say it works according to how well Nephi and Laman and Lamuel get along. Like, I think sometimes I equate Ooh. it with that, you know, like, because it seems like every time when the, the <laughs> cup stops working, it's because there's a little, you know, a little heat going on between those brothers. But it doesn't say that. It says <sighs> this compass is working because of the faith and the diligence of the family. And I like to think that just as their little sibling skirmishes kind of impacted the little um, tick of the compass, I I love to think that the faith of these sisters impacted it too, that they are all having these experiences with Christ. Everyone's contributing, just as Nephi's having his come to Jesus moments on a mountain when he's hunting. Maybe these sisters had their own coming to Jesus moments when they were picking berries and Everyone's collective faith is what carried them across that ocean. I want to mark that. Can you give us the reference for where it says according to their faith? Amelia, yes. I've never considered that, that there included his sisters. That is so Bar-bar. awesome. I know. It says it in First Nephi 16, verse 29. Okay. Oh, I love this. This is so fun. Read that for us. Deal. It says, and there were also written upon them, the Liahona, a new writing, which was plain to be read, which should give us understanding concerning the ways of the Lord. And it was written and changed from time to time, according to the faith and diligence, which we gave unto it. And then you can understand why they chose to go with Nephi. They were righteous. Oh, that's cool. What about you, Ella? What thoughts did you have? I think it's cool that in in verse six, he doesn't say some of my sisters or like a few of, he says my sisters. Like, I I think, I don't know if all of them went, but I think it's cool that that is how he worded that. Um, I loved looking in what happened. So after Nephi's describing some of the things that they did. So they... Um, they built a temple and they set up this society. They were industrious. They did, they labored with their hands. And I just thought it was cool thinking about the sisters' involvement in that. Like these women, they were, they were doing it too. And all throughout the Book of Mormon, in all of these things, they were on the boat. They were um, traveling through the wilderness. And I love how in verse 27 of 2 Nephi 5, the same ver- same chapter, it says, and it came to pass that we lived after the manner of happiness. Mm-hmm. And when I read that, I just had the thought like, women are essential in living after the manner of happiness. We, we need them and we need their influence. And I think that these sisters specifically were were instrumental in creating this happy life for all of these people. Oh, for sure. They did live after the manner of happiness. And it, I think it's so cool that there's that we again. I'm going to be so cognizant of the word we after the sisters yeah. are introduced <laughs> because now it's just going to combine all of them. You guys, that was really phenomenal. Okay, so all of this discussion... And this year, we're going to just be discussing so many women in the Book of Mormon. I'm going to go back to the way we started. And I'm going to ask you this question because you are two very educated women who love the Lord. And I want to know then if someone were to come to you like they did to Margot Butler and say, where are the girls? What would your reply be? Or why do we need to know about the girls? 
Give me your final so, finishing thoughts on this topic. I just think that women have such a unique and powerful influence on the world. And sometimes it's a quiet influence. You almost wouldn't recognize it. And I think that that's seen in the scriptures, right? Like we hear a lot of the stories about these prophets and these men who do amazing things. Um, and I think it's so important to look for the women because it can teach us about how how much women can be an influence and how much we today can influence the people around us. And it doesn't have to be big or loud or something crazy. Like we, by our faith, can be such a force for good. And so... I think I would respond to them by saying they're they're here. They're in every page of these scriptures. You just have to look for it. I love that so much, Ella. I I think how I would respond to them, where are the girls? I think it is, you know, heartbreaking that you know, traditions are real and and it is kind of on the lower end for sure leads you to if you want to get to know them, you have to seek revelation. I mm. love the questions that you asked about this, them in general, that in, in preparation for recording today, man, just thinking about them led to so much revelation for me and so much insight that I never would have gained otherwise. And I think that's a beautiful concept that in order to learn about these women, like you get to talk to God about them. You get to ask him, hey, tell me about your daughters. Like, I want to know. And he'll be like, oh, in this part, like, here's an interesting, did you see this word? Oh my gosh. And in this part, like, I think I learned that God loves talking about his daughters. And if you ask him, like, he wants to talk to you about Soraya. And I never, like, this is kind of a little funny insight that I gained too, is that I'd always kind of seen Soraya in this I don't know, the verses that we get, she's kind of fighting with her husband, right? And so I always kind of thought, "Mm, maybe their relationship, there was a little like tense there, you know? (laughs) But one thought that came to me is, um, well, they had two kids in the woods, basically. You know, like if I were in the wilderness, I'd be like, honey, I love you, but don't even wink at me. I don't even want to risk getting pregnant in the woods, okay? (laughs) You know? (laughs) Oh, it's so true. (laughs) But (laughs) And if you look at that moment where they are kind of fighting a little bit, if you look at it, it's it's so loving. Like you zoom in and she gives her a little piece and it and Lehi says, I am. She says, you are a visionary man. And he says, oh, I am. You know, he doesn't say, Soraya, what are you talking about? He's like, I am. And then it says he comforts her. Mm-hmm. And I just love I think there are so many lessons in that exchange. I think it shows that. You can be the wife of a prophet and still have a faith crisis. If a, if a prophet, if the wife of a prophet can get confused, we can get confused. But mm-hmm. what ended her confusion? Sticking around long enough to see confusion convert to clarity. Sticking to that little glimmer of hope that Jesus will come back into the picture and either change confusion into clarity or change you so that you can handle it. And at the end of the day, who, who, who are the matriarchs of a society who saw the living God, Sariah and her daughters Mm -hmm. and the daughters of Ishmael. Like these, these are the matriarchs who led, who, who paved the way for a whole society to touch the hands of Christ. It was them. And so I think at the end of the day, where are the girls? They are in your prayers asking God about them. Wow. Wow. Well said. I like how you said changing confusion to clarity, because that is exactly what God will do. And he did it for Soraya, and he's done it for all three of us. You both have shared your experiences. So thank you. You guys are delightful. I have loved this discussion of Soraya and her daughters, because it is so cool. Because I started out with Lehi's wife and daughters, but really now it's Soraya and her daughters. Oh my gosh, that was such a good discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I adore you two. That was so fun. Oh, it's so mutual. You came so so well prepared. This has been so fun. Oh, awesome, awesome. Okay. Wow. And thank you to those of you who are listening. 
Thank you for joining us for this first episode of Unnamed Women of the Book of Mormon. It's going to be such a great year. There are so many women to talk about. The Sundown Monday Study Group is a Deseret Bookshelf Plus original brought to you by LDS Living. It's written and hosted by me, Tammy Uzalak Hall. And today, our brilliant study group participants were Amelia Webb and Ella Larson Jessup, who just got married. Can't believe you took the time for this. You're so awesome. Our podcast is produced by Cole Singer and me. It is edited and mixed by Cole Singer, and our executive producer is Aaron Hallstrom. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next week. And please remember, oh, you goodly, goodly women, that you are God's favorite.